Grim Reaper! My name's Will, and I'm dead. I know it's sad, but hey, a lot of awesome people are dead. It happens. And who knows? After long work and dedication in the long run. What, what long run? In the long run, we're all dead. I'm not gonna die. You see, I'm in this thing where if I get sick, I mean, real sick, where I'm about to go, they just take me away and freeze me. Although he is certain to die, perhaps from a household accident, which account for 65% of all unnatural deaths. All right, we did not die today. I don't call that an unqualified success. You're all gonna die. What's wrong with it? I'm dying too. You're going to die. Prepare to die. Death is full of surprises, huh? You have no idea. Welcome to Mortality Movies. I'm your host, Gail Rubin, the doyen of death. That's death, not death. A doyen is a woman who's considered senior in a group who knows a lot about a particular subject, and that would be me when it comes to the party no one wants to plan, a funeral or memorial service. On this series, Myself and two other death educators join me to watch film clips related to death, grief, funerals, and end-of-life issues, and talk about them with the hopes that you will learn something and apply it to your own life. Joining me today are Danielle Slupeski, death doula, and Jenna Reeves, a death doula and a grief coach. And studies indicate that you will remember the information that you learn in relation to a video or television film scene 30% more than just us talking to you. So we're combining the films and the conversation to help you learn what you need to know before you go. And if you are watching this program on YouTube, know that the film clips will be presented as separate film clips that you can access the description box below. So our topic today is types of grief. There are, in addition to what we talked about in our previous episode about the five stages, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, intuitive grieving and instrumental grieving, today we're going to look at a couple of specific kinds of grief starting out with disenfranchised grief. We are going to look at this scene from the Jane Austen Book Club uh, that came out in 2007. The opening where a woman is having a funeral and it's a funeral for her dog. Let's watch this clip. <laughs> it's not warped. I mean, well, if people could have state funerals for their dogs, I think they probably would. I mean, the love that we have for our pets is, is valid. And uh, so that is an example of this guy disenfranchising her grief, putting it down. Um, yeah, it's one of the things that's really interesting about disenfranchised grief is the idea that there are certain scenarios, people, objects, et cetera, that actually deserve our grief, quote unquote. Um, and there's sort of a value judgment that's placed on what we grieve. And oftentimes pets are something that people say, well, I really don't want to hear a comparison about your pet to my deceased loved one because they're not the same. Um, and I just would like to point out, um, and I'm sure both of you have encountered this as well, um, lots of people seek grief support for pet loss, and I have clients mm -hmm. um, who process their loss around the, the loss of a pet. They process their grief with me through that, um, but it's not often talked about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think you, 
you said a really important word there and that was comparison, mm. right? I think so often when we hear of someone's fresh loss or fresh grief, we aim to relate and in our relating, we end up sounding like we're comparing, mm. right? And then it, it comes across as, you know, well, that's not the same or this or that. And it's just, I think it's really important to note that when someone is sharing their fresh grief with you might not be the best time to relate with your own story, to just avoid that altogether. Absolutely. And just being there and honoring them with where they are in that moment. Yeah. And there are other examples of disenfranchised grief, not just pets, but maybe there was an illicit affair and the lover dies and that can't actually be acknowledged mm -hmm. openly. Uh, or, a homosexual relationship that, you know, the straight world may not be able to relate to. Uh, so different kinds of mm -hmm. losses can be cause for disenfranchised grief. Yeah, one of the things that I actually see come up quite often is when folks have an ex-spouse or partner pass away and people will say to them, but that was your ex. Mm. And I think that it's really important to be able to honor what people have added to our lives. Um, and it doesn't mean that we still have to be in that same relationship configuration with them, um, but it is important to acknowledge those additions and mm -hmm. contributions. Mm -hmm. I think another area I see get often overlooked is pregnancy loss. Oh yeah. You know? Yes and not knowing how to navigate that, not knowing where to go with it, not feeling like you can bring it out in the open in the same way. And so there's so many examples of disenfranchised grief. And so yeah. I think it's really neat that we're honoring them. Yes. yes, yes. So our next film clip is from the film Manchester by the Sea that came out in 2016, stars Casey Affleck as a man and who is uh, shocked by his brother's sudden death of a heart attack. And he goes to the hospital to confirm his brother's identity and figure out next steps. This is a example of acute grief. Let's watch this clip. Sudden death for both, um, both of those characters related to the brother and you can see uh, they are shocked and, and trying to figure out, okay, what do we do now? And of course the hospital tells them you have to call a funeral home. But yeah. uh, Danielle, you used to be a nurse. I guess. And you would be involved with these kind of scenes where there's been a sudden death. And Absolutely, it's a really tough spot to be in. Um, oftentimes you're, Hopefully there's a, a little kind of quiet space you can take family to have conversations like this rather than in the hallway. <laughs> but there were times where there wasn't, wow. you know, and it, that wasn't an option. And you don't ever really know exactly how someone's going to respond, you know, and someone can respond kind of like this and pretty flat affect and kind of stoic all the way to extremely um, physical responses and yelling and crying and screaming. And so you never quite know what to, to expect in these moments. It's shocking, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's, I, I often think of acute grief as kind of a pendulum swing. So like Danielle said, either it can be very calm and stoic in terms of a reaction, or it can swing all the way to the other side where it's a very big reaction. And one of the emotions that we associate most heavily with acute grief is anger um, because it helps sort of add a blanket over that shock. Um, and so oftentimes you'll notice that people are experiencing like a lot of tunnel vision. They'll use really basic language. They'll move slowly or they'll be very animated. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that it can look, but that shock piece is huge. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. It looks like uh, the, the Casey Affleck character was in that tunnel vision. Yeah kind of mode, you know, what do we do now? Yeah. Well, you call a funeral parlor, mm -hmm. New England talk. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I noticed that as well. Funeral home, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another aspect of grief, anticipatory grief. Uh, we are returning to one of my favorite TV series in this field, 
the Kaminsky Method, uh, where acting coach Sandy Kaminsky has been avoiding visiting friends with terminal illnesses because he doesn't want to be reminded of his own mortality. And uh, he has been cajoled by his agent and longtime friend, Norman Newlander, to come and visit Norman's ailing wife, Eileen, which he has been avoiding doing. But we finally get to see him come visit her. So after mm -hmm. avoiding going to visit her, that, that hug there at the end, just yeah. recognizing that anticipatory grief. Pure yeah. empathy. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that took me aback in that clip is really like anticipatory grief can come with a lot of processing around what mortality looks like. And you can sense his anxiety when he enters the house and sees that her appearance is different. Yeah. 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 And that I, I love, though, that how they make so many jokes yes. about it, around it. You know, it's like, oh, the nonstop sex. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> yes. You know, it's one of the things that I, I um, encourage or suggest that families do is to set visitors up for success before they come in. So whether that's an email or a text or a quick phone conversation ahead of time, but don't worry about saying the wrong thing. I'm interested in your presence. Leave your distractions at the door. Leave your devices at the door. Just come spend time with me. You know, expect that my visit may be short. You know, don't take that personally. I only have so much energy. So that people have a little bit more of an idea of what to expect when they show up. You know, maybe even saying, I'm wearing oxygen. I'm thinner than the last time you saw me. You know, so people know what to expect a little bit. Th those are yeah. great, great suggestions. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously he was kind of surprised and is like, and she did keep it short, mm -hmm. that visit short. Yeah. And set that boundary very clearly, yeah. which is what I often tell people. No thank you is a complete sentence in grief. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe all the time. All yeah. the time. <laughs> yes, that's right. All the time. No thank you. <laughs> well, we have one more clip from the Kaminsky Method. Um, this is... In fact, the next episode after Eileen dies, uh, he goes to the dry cleaners. And this is where we have a example of unexpected grief. Let's watch this clip. So sad for this man, yes. So unexpectedly, just encountering his wife's dress from months before when they would have gone to a fancy evening in Hollywood, and, and that triggers him. Um, but that happens with a song, or I think we were talking, going to the grocery store. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I've heard from often from clients that one of the hardest things is going somewhere like the grocery store, where you're used yeah. to picking up maybe your, your loved one's favorite cookies, or you know, whatever their love the snack was. And things like this just hit you out of nowhere. And I, one of the things I work with people as much as possible on is breath and using your breath to navigate challenging emotions when they bubble up like this, is that if we kind of liken grief to an ocean, sometimes it's flat and there's calm water and other times there's these big waves or tsunamis that take you out. But if you can continue breathing big, deep, slow belly breaths, it's almost like using your breath as a life raft to float on top of those waves as opposed to being overtaken by them. And it can help a little bit. Very well said, Danielle. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I've, you know, experienced it myself with uh, my husband's death and uh, driving down the road listening to road trip songs and one of his favorite songs came on and I was just bawling my eyes out driving down the road. So unexpected grief can hit, uh, and like Danielle says, just take a couple of deep breaths, and that can really help. That's it for today's mortality movies. I did want to mention that we are having a contest to name all of the sources of the movie and TV clips that are in the opening credits and the closing credits of mortality movies. 
And if you can list them all and email me, gail at a goodgoodbye.com, you can win a t-shirt that says, talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead. That's our motto here, so start a conversation today. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to buy you these books, I think, because I, I think you should read them, you know, instead of that cat book. That's, uh, that's pretty serious stuff there. Yeah, because, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with, uh, with death, I think. It's a big, yeah. big subject with me, yeah. Death. To die. To expire. To pass on. To perish. To peg out. To push up daisies. To push up posies. To become extinct. Curtains. Deceased. Demised. Departed and defunct. I'm watching Cocoon. The spaceship is taking the old people into space. That's the happy ending for old people. If only it were that easy, huh? Yeah, I remember seeing this in the theater 30 years ago. But it's a whole different thing when you're in the demographic. Oh, oh, bad. Yeah, it's like a black it mirror. So bad. Yeah, it it's is. Like well, I think it looks like death. David, David, it looks death. like mourning. I mean, every, looks... every, every, every movie in every cinema is about death. Death sells. Mm -hmm.